Ravnica. The very name of this block can set the hearts of Magic players everywhere fluttering. Its incredibly unique world is an Ecumenopolis, one vast city covering the entire surface of the plane. The set introduced us to the beautiful simplicity of the Ten Guilds and their iconic symbols, characterizing two-color pairs like never before. Ravnica redefined multicolor magic and left such a powerful and long-lasting connection it was revisited seven years later. But first, we tackle the set that started it all. Ravnica City of Guilds was a block that needed to happen, and happened precisely when it did. It came off the heels of the incredibly underwhelming Kamigawa block, whose third set, Savers of Kamigawa, is widely held as one of the worst of all time. Prior to that, Mirrodin block saw the first standard bannings in years. The game needed a shock to the arm, and much like Invasion before it, this multicolor block provided it. The first hint of the set came in the form of a special Ravnica preview on August 18th, 2005. Unveiling Temple Garden showed players only one of what would eventually be 10 dual lands, nicknamed Shock Lands, for dealing two damage for the privilege of entering the battlefield untapped. For the first time since the game's inception, and the first time since being discontinued after revised, true dual lands would find their way back into standard. That is, lands that showcased both basic land types in their type line. Lands that could be found by fetch lands in older formats, and fixed multicolor mana bases and constructed better than any previous attempt. Forums around the world lit up in excitement as players began to speculate what duels would be in each set, and just what did that watermark behind the text mean anyway? Wizards also produced an animated commercial for the set, the predecessor to our super slick CGI promos we get today. This gem was voiced by Michael Dorn, also known as Worf in Star Trek The Next Generation. Ravnica, where ancient guilds rule a city that covers the world. For 10,000 years, their sacred laws protected the peace and cast light in the darkness. But nothing lasts forever. Not even the guilds of Ravnica. The watermark symbol found on Temple Garden represented the Celestia Conclave, whose Temple Garden highlighted their green and white mana nature. In the first Ravnica set, only four guilds were included to let the designers truly showcase their unique mechanics, worlds, and flavor. The Celestia Conclave, the Boros Legion, the Golgari Swarm, and the secretive House Demir were all in the set. The six remaining guilds would be included in the following sets of Guild Pact and Ascension, with each getting three guilds apiece. Each guild would receive their own mechanic and would only appear in the sets they were featured in. There were no Celestia cards found in Guild Pact or Ascension, for example. Each guild had a single set in which to shine, and the designers did their best to define each guild and their uniqueness with the space they had. The Celestia Conclave focused on working together, and taught its members that it's not the individual who was important, it is the group. This was most flavorfully shown in its mechanic, Convoke. With all of your creatures helping to cast your spells, a true synergy of spells and creatures were created, and powerful cards like Court of Calling were the result. Other classic Celestia spells included Glare of Subduel, Loxodon Hierarch, and Celestia Guildmage, the latter bringing hybrid mana to magic for the first time. Hybrid mana was seen as an incredibly unique and stylish way to showcase multicolor without forcing players to actually play multiple colors, an idea that would later be pushed to its extreme in Shadowmoor and Eventide. But in Ravnica City of Guilds, it was used sparingly, as only three cards per guild featured hybrid mana costs. Each guild features a leader, and the leader of the Celestia Conclave is not just one person, of course, but the chorus of the Conclave, a group of ancient dryads. Tulsimir Wolfblood, along with his trusty wolf Voja, was a guild priest and the Celestia Guild champion. Each guild also features a guild home that helps define it. And for Celestia, it was Vitu Ghazi, the city tree. This powerful and flavorful token producer saw plenty of play in Ravnica Standard. Celestia was the token-focused guild, and its spells showed it. Not only did the guild mage create tokens, so did its watermarked spells and creatures, like Seedspark, 
and Celestia of Angel. Pawn Bright Wings, one of the most powerful limited spells in the set, quickly flooded the battlefields with tokens to power out more Convoke spells. Even their mass removal spell, Hour of Reckoning, spared tokens from its fate. Next we look at the Green and Black Guild, the Golgari Swarm. It fuses the opposing values of life and death, providing a service to the planet by disposing of carcasses civilization leaves behind, while mysteriously providing sustenance for the forgotten and the needy. Quite simply, if it's dead, dying, or coming back to life on Ravnica, it's probably Golgari. Flourishing in the overgrown tomb, the guild was ruled by the triplicate Gorgon sisters called the Sisters of Stone Death but their rule did not go uncontested. Savra, queen of the Golgari, is the guild champion, working tirelessly to overthrow them. Their guild hall is Sfothgos, the restless tomb, which, of course, focuses on creatures in your graveyard. This leads us to the most infamous mechanic of the entire original Ravnica block, in Dredge. Dredge would use your graveyard as a resource like never before, and powerful Dredge cards included Golgari Grave Troll, Stinkweed Imp, and Dark Blast. While the mechanic was fun and interesting in Ravnica Limited, kept under control due to its varying nature and smaller deck size, later printings of cards like Dread Return, Narco Amoeba, and Bridge from Below began to build a beast that was too unwieldy to bear. Soon decks were doing nothing but dumping cards in their graveyard and flashing back Dread Return on Flamekin Zealot by sacrificing three Narc Amoebas dredged in the process, then using zombies generated from Bridge from Below to kill an opponent in one gloriously overpowered turn. Golgari Grave Troll and Dread Return were banned from the moment Modern existed as a format and have remained on that list ever since. Manalus Dredge, utilizing Bazaar of Baghdad as both an enabler to get cards in your graveyard from hand and dredge even more, remains a viable strategy in the vintage format, where the most powerful cards and strategies of all time are showcased. The Boros Legion are the military of Ravnica, the guild of righteous law and fierce justice keeping the fires of the sacred foundry burning bright. They are accustomed to doing whatever it takes, including force, to keep the peace. The original Boros Guild mechanic, Radiance, is often noted as a failing of the set, as the mechanic was both incredibly weak in gameplay and not the most flavorful either. But the Boros Legion are far more interesting in their story and makeup. The Legion was founded by Razian, the parent and leader of its members. More like a demigod to the army than a true military leader, she inspired them to do great things, while occasionally getting involved herself. Their guild hall, Sunhome, Fortress of the Legion, is the most fortified structure in all of Ravnica. Part fortress, part barracks, and part temple. Sacred Foundry is not called sacred for nothing. As for leadership, angels are at the top of the guild, including the powerful Firemane angels, all of whom were made in Razia's image. After that, it gets a little complicated. The Legion is split into two groups, the Wojak League, the police force and street constables of the plain, and the Boros Army. Agris Cause is a member of the Wojak League, and it was his investigation, one of his very last before retirement, that sets the plot of Ravnica in motion. A world-weary detective straight out of noir fiction, complete with an ex-wife and a deep distrust of rookies, his character features a couple of twists away from the formula. He's more than a century old, albeit nearing the end of his lifespan. Though he drinks Bumbat, Ravnica's alcoholic swill, his real addiction is to concentrated healing magic drugs nicknamed Teardrops. Donato Giancola's painting for the card Agra's Cause, Wojak Veteran, is actually named Othello after the Moorish captain in the Shakespearean play. While his appearance doesn't affect Agra's Cause in the lore, it's worth noting that Agra's Cause was the first such major magic character since Teferi. House Demir is the secret guild of the Ten. Publicly, there are only nine guilds. But when the Demir are discovered plotting to wreck the guild pack that has held strong for almost 10,000 years, Ravnica is thrown in turmoil. In their watery graves, the Demir are led by the evil and powerful Zadak, Lord of Secrets, who pulls the strings behind the scenes. The goal of the Demir is complete and total control, but also complete and total invisibility, often using shapeshifters such as the worm-like masses known as lupals to take out and take the place of useful pawns. The lupals appear in their true form on only one card in Mind Leech Mass. 
the Namir are easily described as the Illuminati of Ravnica, and their powerful transmute mechanics saw plenty of constructed play, allowing players to tutor for just the right spell when they needed it. Duskmantle House of Shadow is their guild hall. For those who know where to find it, of course, only residents and their immediate underlings knew its exact location. The Namir are also behind the plot of the set's tie-in novel. While investigating the death of a recent partner, and with said partner along for the ride in ghost form, Agra's cause uncovers a massive conspiracy. The leader of the Demir, Zadak, put into place a puppet queen of the Golgari, Savra, and tried to get her into the Celestia Guild. The plan was to destroy the Celestia during the festival celebrating the Deca Millennial Anniversary of the Guild Pact, that's 10,000 years, with Savra exporting the Mind Link, known as the World Soul, to corrupt the entire Celestia Guild and wipe it out at once. It took Augra's cause of the Boros Legion to stop the disaster and arrest Zadek, which, unbeknownst to him, triggered a clause in the Guild Pact that soon destabilized and threatened all of Ravnica. Ravnica is a set and block that is full of mega cycles. These mega cycles cover multiple sets, and all of the guilds feature the same 13 cycles of cards. We've discussed the Shocklands, the Guild Homes, and the Guild Mages so far. We've also spoken of guild leaders and their champions, so what other cycles are out there? First, we have the Signets. These powerful artifacts are some of the best mana fixing the game has ever seen and showcase the guild symbol for all color pairs. Speaking of mana, all guilds had their own Karoo lands, also known as Bounce lands. Karoo lands first debuted in Visions, where they featured an awkward return and untapped land clause. When the new Ravnica versions were revealed, Karoo was quickly chosen as the nickname for the mechanic of having a land produce two mana and returning a land to compensate. Ravnica had a mega cycle of each of these for each guild and they were incredibly powerful in both draft and constructed. Their power was not evident at first, but soon top drafters were taking these cards over powerful rares as they both accelerated and fixed your mana simultaneously. Other mega cycles include the guild artifacts, all featuring activation costs for the guilds they represented. Ravnica showcased Sunforger, Bloodletter Quill, Crown of Convergence, and Plague Boiler. The latter was incredibly exciting when it was first spoiled, as it harkened back to the powerful enchantment Pernicious Deed. Unfortunately, it was not close to the power of that Invasion Block classic. Each guild also received a cycle of common and rare hybrid spells. Each common had a single hybrid mana, and the rares featured two or more. For example, Gaze of the Gorgon was a powerful limited trick, while Glean Crawler was the Golgari rare. Boros continued with Boros Recruit, and Master Warcraft, while Celestia featured Centaur Safeguard and Privileged Position. Demir completed the cycle with Lurking Informant and Shadow of Doubt. Every guild got their own common gold spell that featured both the mana of the guild and the mechanic on them. Ravnica's included Rally the Righteous, Perplex, Shambling Shell, and Guardian of Vitugazi. Off-color rares were a highlight, with each guild getting two cards of varying rarity and all featuring two of one guild color and a single mana from the other half. Boros' cycle included Firemane Angel at rare, while Flame Ken Zealot was uncommon. Demir has Clutch of the Undercity and Mind Leech Mass. Celestia had Congregation at Dawn and Phyto Hydra, while Golgari completed the cycle with Drooling Grudion and Graveshell Scarab the latter a card that made some small waves in Constructed. Each guild features a cycle of off-color activated permanents. For example, Transluminant and Votary of the Conclave. Boros featured Ordrune Commando and Screeching Griffin, while Demir showcased Tattered Drake and Roofstalker White, both very powerful and limited. Golgari switched it up a bit as it had more to pee, but instead of an activation for its other half, it was a mana producer in the form of Elves of Deep Shadow, a card that hadn't seen print at the time since the dark. The final mega cycle included a series of allied boosting spells, such as Vigor Mortis and Rolling Spoil, cards that got an additional boost if you played the spell using the other half of the guild's mana. Boros included the very powerful limited bomb of Flash Conscription and powerful trick of Boros Fury Shield while Demir's first pickable was always Ribbons of Night. Indu's Paranoia, while interesting, was never quite as playable. 
Dryad's Caress could turn entire games around but was expensive, while Seed Spark was far more playable at only 4 mana and with a healthy boost of token creatures. But even a set built around guilds isn't just guild cards. There was a full aura sub-theme to the set, where powerful enchantments ran rampant, providing boosts like never before. A full cycle of enchantments gave you bonuses when you played them, such as Fists of Ironwood and Galvanic Arc. Cards like Aura Touch Maged would go find them, and monsters like Bramble Elemental received bonuses for being enchanted with them. There was also a complete cycle of newly minted, hunted creatures, including the Lamasu, whose creature type debuted in this set. Hunted Phantasm, Horror, Dragon, and Troll filled out the cycle. Despite their incredibly unique and fun nature, very few saw constructed play and the design has not been revisited since. Dark Confidant made its debut in Ravnica and became a multi-format all-star soon thereafter. Also known as Bob, it gets that nickname due to the face of Bob Maher, the winner of a Magic Invitational whose first place prize put his likeness on the card and contributed to its design. It was later reprinted in Modern Masters, but to much chagrin, it featured a new, non-Bob Maher character. Doubling Season also made its debut in Ravnica and is one of the most powerful and desired casual cards ever made. A card that is basically impossible to reprint in standard due to the existence of planeswalkers who wouldn't show up for another two years, it remains one of the most valuable cards in the set and was later reprinted as a judge foil and again using the same artwork in Modern Masters. For the first time in the history of the game, Birds of Paradise was not included in a core set. Instead, it was printed in Ravnica. This powerful mana producer and accelerant fit perfectly in the multicolor world Ravnica provided and quickly returned to the core set with 10th edition. It was later reprinted in Magic 2010, 2011, and 2012 where it has laid dormant ever since. The powerful counterspell Reman was printed here and quickly became recognized as one of the most powerful counterspells unleashed in some time. It immediately became a staple in standard and the extended formats of its era and remained so for as long as it was legal. Blazing Archon, while debuting the creature type Archon to Magic, also became a go-to reanimator target for many thanks to its unique ability and huge evasive body. Watch Wolf blew the minds of many when it was printed, a push in power level so drastic that many couldn't believe it. Previous cheap 3-3s such as Albino Troll or Rogue Elephant came with a significant drawback, but Watch Wolves did not. Lightning Helix debuted in Ravnica and quickly saw constructed play for its existence in standard. It was paired with Isochron Scepter in the extended constructed format, and between Lightning Helix and Orem's Chant, it remained a staple of the format until Modern replaced it years later. But the heart of Ravnica, and the reason it resonates with so many, is not just card power level. It is the incredibly thematic design, the mechanics that tie so flavorfully into each guild, and the ability for all Magic players to identify and be proud of the guild they represented. Guild symbols have quickly become ubiquitous in Magic, with many players getting tattoos of the guild that describes them and their playstyle the most. Ravnica City of Guilds was a massive success by any measure. Players returned to the game in droves after the mistakes of Mirrodin and the underwhelming impact of Kamigawa. It ushered in a new exciting era for Magic and is a hallmark in good game design, not just Magic design. And we're not done yet with both the cards and the story, because a guild pact is being broken and the tale of Ravnica is just getting started. Thanks for watching. Did you enjoy this episode? Help me make more by supporting the show over at Patreon. Sponsor the content you enjoy so I can keep making it. Patrons get to see the episodes before anyone else, get their names in the credits, and more. Head on over to Patreon, and I'll see you guys there.